I'm Mark Rush Jr., partner at Prodigy Search. As part of Prodigy Search Presents interview series, we are speaking with a few members of our DNI Board of Advisors as they play a major role advocating for change within their organizations and also within sports and entertainment industries as well. Our goal with this mini series is to continue to educate and provide guidance to sports and entertainment leaders as our DNI board members share valuable insights and best practices. With that in mind, we're here for three questions with Vince Pearson. Many of you probably know Vince, but by way of a quick 30 second commercial, he is currently the CEO of VSP Diversity Solutions, a company he founded in early 2020. He previously spent time as diversity and inclusion client partner for Bloomberg. Also, he was head of diversity and inclusion for minor league baseball for four and a half, five years. And I find this very fascinating as well. Vince, earlier in your career, um, was, a, was a graduate assistant for the Tides program at the University of Central Florida. Um, Vince, honored to have you here today, and thank you so much for your time and for this brief discussion. Oh, it's my pleasure, Mark. I'm looking forward to it. So let's jump right in. The, you know, again, quick hitters, three questions. The first one that came to mind when we were scheduling today's uh, conversation was something that I think about quite often, right? And it's not just timely you know, for right now. It, it should have been more of a discussion in the past, and it will be a discussion in the future, I hope, I know you hope, <laughs> is if you were asked to advise a team owner or a team president in the sports industry, on their very first steps to improve their organization from a diversity and inclusion perspective, where do they even begin, right? That's always, and I just, just the beginning, I don't want the whole playbook. I don't want you kind of giving away all the secrets, but I think that's the biggest thing is getting over the hurdle of what are we, what's the first step? Where do we begin in terms of implementing better DNI programming strategies and approaches for a team owner or team president? You know, I think for, you know, we're, we're looking at the leader, right? The, the top of the organization at that point. And, and most of the time, that person is very knowledgeable, very smart, um, and, and very capable of getting things done. So for that person, the first step that they would need to take in this conversation is questioning their own assumptions um, and identifying areas to act. Uh, you know, especially along, you know, dimensions of diversity. So when it comes to gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, whatever the dimension of diversity is, that we all have baked in our own assumptions. And I can't tell you, even now, uh, you know, with a few CEOs that I work with, um, when we talk about inclusion in their workspaces, the comment I've heard over and over is, well, we're pretty inclusive, I think. I, I feel like our organization is really inclusive. And my response is, well, you know, you can measure that. You know, so it's, it's kind of like, rather than making those types of assumptions, what can be done to provide some clarity and some insight into the experiences of others? Um, so, you know, I think for the person at the top, what has to happen is, is really sparking this curiosity to really want to dig in and understand this space. Um, and I think that's probably not going to be folks' favorite answer because we want to know the thing to do so that in six months, we're looking at a different picture. Quick fix, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but it, it, we're not going to sustain progress that way. Um, once you have a CEO, a team president, a team owner who's curious about this piece of the conversation, that's sustainable. You don't get to change that piece of you once you flip that switch on. So I think that's the most important part is how do we flip that switch? And then we've got our team owner who becomes de facto chief diversity officer number two or probably number one. <laughs> It's fascinating to hear you say, and you didn't say directly, but I know you were getting at it earlier when you talked about the the evaluation piece, right? I mean, and, and again, the whether it be formally, hopefully, uh, or informally, but certainly formally and and through um, some research and, and some surveying and some anecdotal, you know, et cetera. I mean, but how are we, can we actually, are we actually evaluating this? Or are we just assuming either everything's great or everything's not great? And, and why are we assuming either one of those two things? So it's fascinating to hear you say that. Absolutely. And that it happens so often and look, it's, it's not like um, it's a fault or anything. We, we're often encouraged to steer clear of these types of conversations, even if it's just soft nudges. So it's almost how do you create nudges in the other direction um, for yourself and, and for leaders within your organization to be thinking about this constantly. And I've heard, I've, I've, you, know, you and I've chatted a lot about this, but we've also, I've also heard you in other forums talk about this. And you talked about the, um, that team owner, team president being the, the one, the one A, or perhaps the, the, the number two uh, chief diversity officer. But that's critical that it, that it is 
start it, implement it, and follow through at the top level too. So I like that you indicated that this can't be, you know, somebody at the at the most junior level that has no power and resources and influence uh, and 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 a voice to make those changes as much as the person at the top then can make it a, an organizational shift. So I love that you you pointed that out as well. Yeah, there are far too many uh, DNI program managers, and look, you know, I think there's a lot of good that comes from any focus uh, within an organization on DNI, but if there's no visibility at that decision maker level beyond decision making at a, you know, at kind of an interpersonal level for employees, you know, the impact is always going to be less than it could. Uh, yeah. So no, I think it's, it's something to really be mindful of. Vince, what about, so, so you had me thinking uh, about this and I've thought a lot about this over the, over the recent months as well is uh is that title is that position uh that we that you mentioned just a moment ago so i'd, I'd like for you to talk about the idea of of the head head of dni or the chief diversity officer what what, what should they focus on uh, and, and what should they avoid so if you can only offer them one thing in both of those areas what, what's the kind of key area of focus and then what's the thing they should steer clear of they think because what and the reason i worded it that way i guess or i ask it that way is where my mind goes is I, I think a common mistake, and I think I've heard you say this in the past as well, is where the, the head of DNI or chief diversity officer is hired uh, to check a box, and let's let's just call it what it is. They're 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 hired to check a box, but they're not given the the resources and et cetera, and they're basically set up for failure. I mean, let, let's let's be honest, right? So they're given that title and they're making a hire, but it's just to say that they've done it. Um, so if you had to give that that either head of DNI or that chief diversity officer either advice or things to to steer clear of, what would those two things be? So the I'll start. I'm going to start with what to steer clear of, um, and, and this is um, this is something that immediately comes to mind is is if you have that visibility into the C-suite, if you have that level of influence within an organization there can be kind of this invisible pool to assimilate into the culture that already exists. Um, my good friends at the Winners Group and Brittany Harris specifically um, says when we look at CDO and that Chief Diversity Officer, we should change the D to disruption. Um, so if, if in that seat and you're not finding yourself disrupting conversations, at least I'd say frequently, maybe not every conversation, but at least frequently having some role in disrupting a conversation or disrupting a process that needs to be disrupted to be corrected, um, then you may be assimilating and it's gonna be really tough to create change. So that would be the thing I think to avoid it and that, that the pool to do that is invisible. Uh, you know, it, it's gonna be like gravity pushing you in that direction you don't even realize. So you gotta be intentional about that. <clears throat> The thing that you definitely should do is, uh, well, the one thing I'll say, I want to say two. One is get in and spend time with any leader that has decision-making power. Um, don't make it a diversity inclusion conversation. Get, it's a get to know you. Um, that's probably good for any executive starting, I think, especially diversity inclusion, because if you're doing your role effectively, you're you're impacting across the entire organization. Um, and at the end of the day, we're dealing with people and you're gonna need to be able to influence those people. The other thing is to track your impact. Um, if data doesn't already exist, then you're gonna have to put the mechanisms in place to create and track that. Um, there may be some traditional data that exists across gender, ethnic minority lines. Um, you may need to get a bit more granular or, or in depth with the analysis to understand employee experience, or maybe there's an additional filter. Maybe we want to look at women of color specifically. Um, so I think to, to have that data set that you're going to analyze and kind of measure, maybe not measure yourself by completely, because look, if, if we're in a, a small organization, there's not a lot of turnover, and then that's the only measure you have, then success is always going to look slow. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to need those at some point to be able to tell the full and accurate story of your organization. So I think data collection and analysis is a big piece. Uh, and that goes for representation and culture and effectiveness of projects. Um, and then just really avoiding the, the urge to assimilate once you get into that leadership seat. Because again, go back to the point from my friends at the Winners Group, as that chief diversity officer, you've got to be disrupting 
processes and conversations. <laughs> it, it's fascinating to hear you uh, two things that, that that caught my ear there. The 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 measurement piece, right? I mean, and and that. Uh, because and frankly, you mentioned it a little bit on the first uh, answer as well. But since you talked about again the data and and, and the um, this person's ability to track what they're doing, my hope and this is something you and I talked about is that then that changes the way this isn't a short term fix, but also it's a long term like it's a long term goal, but it's also a long term play. This person should be there in this role for years to come, and my hope is you know, now it's on a one person shop, right? Because I asked that question, maybe I phrased it unintentionally this way, but as you're answering that first thought was, you know, that person's going to those meetings solo, right? There's no, you know, very rarely I would say, and you could speak to this because you've been in that seat before, there's not huge robust staffs of DNI out there, right? You know, those, they're situated either at the sea level or they're under maybe HR, right? That's, I guess that's kind of a nice place to put it sometimes, but there's not two, three, five, ten staff members in that department yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And that's such a big piece too. Um, and, and especially in sports. And, and look, I, I think that it's all part of growth and progress and that, um, you know, this is hopefully in five years, this does look a lot different, but yeah, that, that has been very thematic is that you see one, maybe two. Uh, my, my recommendation in that would be, and this is, you know, it may land differently and we might not get deep into it, but to have it situated with leadership visibility. And if you can, not under HR. I know that's like a natural place to put it. Yeah, of course. Um, but again, if we're talking about disrupting processes, um, HR may be one of the places that, that, that has to be disrupted and to do that from within when you're reporting into can, can sometimes be challenging. One of the things that I've heard, um, and, and, it's, and it ties into my next question and this one tie in together, because I, I've heard you, I've heard others talk about it, and I've, I've been an advocate for, for this as well, which is I, my hope is where the industry continues to go. It's not there now, clearly a lot of work to be done, is that the, the hiring of diverse individuals is not only in these positions we're talking about, right? That it should be sales, marketing, you know, analytics. You go down the, the finance, HR, it should be across the board. And again, I think we experience it more in Prodigy with sales and marketing executives, but let's talk about that because we deal with job seekers all the time. And I've, um, we had a discussion at, at the National Sports Forum last year about um, how can individuals, um, diverse individuals promote and really sell their diversity, right? And, and, and have that and be champions for their own causes. And hopefully others can do that and advocate for them as well. But looking at the diversity angle, their different perspectives, right? Their different skills, their ideas, uh, the, the things that they bring in the conversation that are different, how do we sell those as strengths or how do we market those as a job seeker, whether it's the five-year person that's in their, you know, low to mid twenties or the, the senior executive that's been doing this for, you know, two, three decades, but still maybe hasn't achieved that, that, that big level. And, and maybe let's say, you know, we'll point out the reasons why they haven't and maybe because they haven't been considered and the industry hasn't evolved. Let's talk about marketing as a job seeker, how do job seekers better, you know, maybe position themselves and, and, and really sell it. I mean, hey, yeah, I'm a female in the industry. Yes, I'm a person of color in the industry. And, and by the way, here's the 20 different things I bring that you don't have on your staff right now. And it's because of my, my background. Yeah, and there are some really, you know, even specific examples that come to mind. The one with, with uh, when the XFL um, was bought by Dwayne The Rock Johnson and his, and his business partner, who was a woman, and she was completely left out of a lot of those conversations. <clears throat> there were a handful of women writers who did not make that mistake. Now, this is not to say that hire a woman and you, you save yourself from that mistake. I don't think it's fair to put, you know, that type of responsibility on someone sp specifically based on identity. But that's kind of like, hey, there were blind spots here. We all jumped to the shiny thing and we missed uh, a really important thing. Oh, and something that also could have done something by in the way of us covering this inclusively. Um, I think that the, it's almost which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And in, in this case, I'm gonna say that the industry has to, has to value and desire these things first. Uh, maybe not first, but at least simultaneously. Because if I build up and, and I share that my perspective as a black man working in sports, is this unique perspective that you don't have and that you need, you're like, you know, some, an organization could say we don't have, but we've also been doing great without, and why do we need that now, 
mm-hmm. uh, versus an organization that understands like, hey, that's a good point. We haven't had that kind of flavor on our marketing practices or our approach to telling stories. What might that look like? And now I can share my portfolio that says, well, this is the spin that I put or this is the approach that I take or this is how I dig in. Um, you know, a lot of it is, <clears throat> I think that, so that piece is how do you, how do organizations assess and find value? Um, then for the candidate who is approaching that search, I think it's really just a matter of authenticity. And, and that's where, you know, I think the industry has to value it first, because if I want to break into this industry who, who tells me that these are the five things we're looking for, it doesn't matter if I'm black, Hispanic, Asian, I'm going to try my best to be those five things. Right. And that's where we get assimilation and you kind of have even you'll get diversity, but you don't get the benefit of diversity because in order to get the seat, I had to act just like him over there. And, and now, you know, the group thing, thing happens. So I think it has to, you know, you create a space where it can be valued um, so that folks can actually start exploring their authenticity in their development stages of early internship, entry-level positions, maybe even their college experience. Um, I I think there's too much of trying to fit into a cookie cutter pattern of what the marketing intern is supposed to do. (laughs) Um, And then, you know, what that does is is recreate itself over and over. And we, we, we can even have diversity without the benefit of different perspectives. We gotta create a space where we can actually accept those perspectives. It's, uh, you used the word groupthink, and, and for some reason, when you start start talking about that and, and some of what you described earlier, um, I'm sure you know David Livingston. David, somebody that we placed uh, an executive, uh, for those of you that don't know, an executive at Spectra right now, he used to work at the Alliance of American Football, where we placed him, and uh, I believe earlier in his career was with IMG, but David said something to me, and it was to a group, it was to a crowd, but he and I were having a and a and he talked about that. He said, you know, when I come to a sales meeting, he's a senior sales executive and marketing executive, he said, and I, you know, bring up ideas and, and, and things of that nature, he said, and he used kind of your word disruption, but it was in a different context. He goes, my, 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 I'm not trying to start something, I'm not disrupting, I'm not causing trouble. I'm bringing a new and fresh idea, I'm bringing a new approach, uh, a new strategy, and he's still educating. So it's a little bit of chicken and the egg thing, right, where they, he comes to a meeting and and to use your example, are they, do the people in that meeting need to be just receptive to the way, here's the way we've always done things. And he's a 25 year of experience guy. He's not a junior person. He's coming in saying, no, why haven't we done it this way? Or why haven't we thought about this perspective? So it's unique that it still happens even at his level. And it's not just the entry level, you know, marketing, to your point, marketing intern uh, who experiences that. Well, I'm just going to act like everybody else now to fit in. So yeah, if, if you're, if you're at this, if you're the top or one of the top guys and you're still having to be concerned about what disruption or, or different perspective might look like, imagine the pressure on yeah. it. You still got to deliver, by the way. You still have to sell. You still have to exactly. contribute. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He still has to work. Yeah. So, you know, that, that is very much one of the, you know, harms of groupthink is it create, it almost, it, it almost forces, when I talk about that gravity that pulls you into assimilating, Groupthink is one of those things where it's like, I don't want to break rank and, and change the course of this brainstorm. But no, somebody needs to, because otherwise we're never going to have those bright, new, fresh ideas that, that you know, impact the bottom line. So, yeah, I think that it's, um, it's definitely something to be aware of. Listen, I said it was going to be brief. I'm going to stick to my word. Um, kept, it, kept it to a reasonable amount of time as, as kind of a mini series, not our full length uh, feature films that Prodigy Search presents is at 45 minutes in length. But um, Vince, I, I always appreciate your insights, your answers, uh, your brilliant ideas. And, and, I, and I want to reiterate from something I mentioned at the beginning. Obviously, you're, you're currently consulting with uh, organizations, individuals, agencies uh, on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. And um, you're still involved with uh, the National Sports Forum's BDSE program. Sports Biz Camps was a sure a labor of love this spring and summer, although not quite what you want it to be pre-pandemic, I'm sure with uh, other organizers. Um, but I wanted to give, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I wanted to make sure you had the opportunity, um, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing information on your organization, how, can, how, if you, you know, how to get in contact with you or how to follow you. Um, I'd, I'd like people to, to know how to do that. Absolutely. Uh, one of the best ways to reach me is um, on LinkedIn. Um, uh, Vincent S. Pearson on LinkedIn. Um, I do have a website, www.vincentpearson.com. Um, and then I'm always available via email as well, uh, vspearson at me.com. 
and you know, I'm, I love chatting. I love these types of conversations. Um, but even more so, I love getting in and building strategies so that we can actually see the work start to drive the change we want to see. So I'm happy to connect. Please reach out. No, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Vince. I really appreciate it. Good luck. Thanks so Thanks much. Sir. Take care.